The next topic is about finding domains. Domain is really important. If you remember what a domain is, domain is what numbers can you plug into a function and make sure it's still defined. So domains, I always think of the x values. What values can I plug in and it works? So it says, working with algebraic expressions involving x, you face potential difficulty of substituting a value of x which represents or which the expression is not defined. So it does not produce a real number. For example, the expression the square root of 2x plus 3 is not defined when x equals negative 2 because, well, you see when they plug in a negative 2, 2 times negative 2 is negative 4 plus 3 would be a negative 1. So you would end up with the screw square root of negative 1. And if you remember, you cannot take the square root of any negative number. You can take the square root of only 0 and uh, positive numbers. So that's called non-negative numbers. So it says the set of values for which the expression is defined is called the domain. That's what it is. Domain is when is a function defined. It's an, usually an infinite number of values, so we usually write, like writing our domain in interval notation. It says, so the domain of the square root of 2x plus 3 is the set of all values of x such that the square root of 2x plus 3 is a real number. In other words, where is it defined? In order for this um, to represent a real number, it's necessary that, well, whatever we are taking the square root of, whatever you take the square root of has to be non-negative. Again, it can be zero because the square root of zero is zero, or it has to be positive. So what they did is they solved the inequality, which we did earlier in this. They solved the inequality 2x plus 3 is greater than or equal to zero. Let's do that real quick. 2x plus 3 is greater than or equal to zero. I'd subtract 3 from both sides, so I'd have 2x is greater than or equal to negative 3. I'd divide both sides by 2, and I'd have x is greater than or equal to negative 3 halves, okay? So if you're thinking about that number line, here's negative 3 halves. Plot that point negative 3 halves. And then you look at the point of the direction. It's x is greater than or equal to. Shade it to the right. And then we can equal that number, so it would be a bracket. So if we were using interval notation, it would be bracket negative 3 halves starting on the left all the way to infinity on the right. Remember, you have to use parentheses anytime it's an infinity. So that's how they got this answer right there. The negative 3 halves to infinity would be the domain of that function. Okay. So what we want to do is practice finding domains of functions. When we find domains of functions, we need to think about simple rules that we know. Things like square root of x. What can you take the square root of what numbers can you take the square root of? Well, only zero and positive. Fractions, what restrictions do I have with fractions? Well, you can never divide by zero with a fraction. Those are keys to our understanding. There's gonna be some other functions that you might wanna remember. For instance, logarithms. The natural log of x or log base anything of x is only defined from zero to infinity. So we will see domains of other functions as well this semester, um, but right now we're just concentrating on simple algebraic expressions. All right, so let's look at the first one. It says, find the domain of each expression, write your answer in interval notation. Again, we have an infinite number of answers, so we want to write them in interval notation. Anytime you're taking a square root, whatever's underneath the radical needs to be greater than or equal to zero. So x minus two has to be greater than or equal to zero. Simply solve that inequality by adding two to both sides. You'd have x is greater than or equal to two. Think about that number line. Here's the number two. Because x is on the left and its x is greater than or equal to, the arrow points the direction we'd be shading to the right. It's greater than or equal to, so in this case we would use a bracket because we can include that number. So it seems to me that the answer would be bracket 2 comma infinity with a parenthesis. Any number 2 or bigger we can plug in to this equation and get an answer. You can always test your answer too. Um, just by picking a random number, like for instance, how about the number, consider the number 
I don't know, how about 11? I'm just picking a random number. If you plug it into the original function, if I plugged in 11 here, I'd have 11 minus 2, which is 9. The square root of 9 is a 3. So that is defined. It does exist. And then you can always check to make sure it doesn't work by checking a number that's not in there. So for instance, uh, let's consider the number, I don't know, how about uh, negative 2? Consider the number negative 2, it's not in the interval. If I plugged it into this original, negative 2 minus 2 would be negative 4. And I'd be looking at the square root of negative 4. Because it's a negative number, it is undefined. So that does make sense. So you can always check your answer by plugging in numbers to, to the original to make sure it is defined where you said it is. Let's look at B here. It says 1 over the square root of 3x minus 2. Well, usually what we have is whatever's underneath the radical has to be greater than or equal to zero. But in this unique case, we can't have that it's division by zero either because it is in the denominator of a fraction. So rather than just greater than or equal to zero, what we need to set up here is 3x minus 2 is strictly greater than zero because it could not equal zero. If it equaled zero, we'd have division by zero. So let's solve this simply by adding two to both sides. We'd have 3x is greater than two. Divide both sides by three, and we'd have x is greater than two-thirds. Thinking about that number line, here's the number two-thirds. Um, the arrow points the direction. It's greater than, it's bigger than that number, so we would shade to the right of it. And because it's strictly greater than cannot equal that number, we would have to use a parentheses, not a bracket. So the final answer from the left would be parentheses two-thirds all the way to the right, which is infinity. Move on to C here. C here is trying to get you to remember, do you remember what happens when you have cube roots, okay? Anytime you have square root, fourth root, sixth root, eighth root, any even root number, you're restricted because you cannot take an even root of a negative number. But the beautiful thing about odd roots, three, the cubed root, the fifth root, the seventh root, the ninth root, so on. Anytime you have an odd root, there are no restrictions. You can have negative numbers in this case. So there's no restrictions. Let me write that out. And because there's no restrictions, our answer is every possible number, which would be negative infinity to infinity. No restrictions, the answer is negative infinity to infinity. The only reason, again, that this one had no restrictions is because it was an odd root, not an even root. Let's continue on. The next one says, perform the operations indicated and simplify your answers. Perform the operations indicated and simplify your answers. So this one really... Um, not too difficult. All we're doing is adding like terms. Uh, one thing that I do want, want to note here, uh, when you're simplifying these, you always want to write in descending order. So what's descending order? Descending order means the highest power first, um, and then you stagger down the power. So for instance, here I see an x cubed, I see an x squared, I see an x, and then I see a constant. So you're always going to write your um, answers in descending order, and all you have to do on these ones is combine like terms. When I say like terms, it has to be the same variable, and it has to be the same power to combine it. So 2x cubed is the first one that I see. That's the highest power. I'm going to go ahead and cross it out. 3x squared is the next one, so I'll do plus 3x squared. Now I'm going to look at this. I do see like terms that I can combine here. I have a minus 2x and a minus 3x. Adding those together, I would have a minus 5x. And then I look and I also have like terms with the constants. A 5 minus 7 would be a negative 2. So there's my minus 2 right there. My final answer on that problem would be 2x cubed plus 3x squared minus 5x minus 2. I'm going to go ahead and clean this up. If you notice your handwriting's a little ambiguous, I can't tell that that's a 3 right there. Please erase it and redo it. Make sure it's absolutely clear to me and any other reader what those numbers are. So be careful with your handwriting so I can read it just as I want to be careful so you can read mine. All right, so part A, super, super easy. Part B is one of the most important problems that you can learn in this class. Again, in calculus, the issues are not with calculus. The calculus rules are easy. Um, it's just a whole bunch of rules that you have to memorize, but if you memorize the rules, 
Calculus is the easy part of calculus. Algebra is the difficult part of calculus. I cannot express that enough. One of the biggest algebraic mistakes students make is subtracting, they forget to distribute the negative. So when you subtract something, you have to be careful of those parentheses. If there's parentheses, you have to distribute that negative to every single one of those terms. So I cannot stress this enough. You must distribute the negative. Distribute the negative. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this problem while distributing the negative. I'd have my 2x minus 3 in fronts just fine. Distribute the negative to the first term, I'd have a minus x squared. The next term, I'd have a minus 2x. And the last term, I'd have a plus 4. A lot of students distribute the negative to the first term, but forget the remaining terms. OK, so what do I have? Now I need to write it in descending order. The first would be the negative x squared. I could combine the next two terms. I'd have a 2x and a minus 2x, which actually cancel each other out. And then I have a minus 3 plus 4. Minus 3 plus 4 would leave me with a plus 1. Last thing I need to check, is there anything else I can do here? No other terms I can combine. I don't need to worry about factoring, even though technically this is a difference of squares if you wrote it properly. There's no need to factor on this problem because there's no more simplification to do. So that's it for this problem.